Uh, good morning, everyone. Welcome back in. And uh, again, on my part, welcome to Washington, D.C. And I hope you're enjoying the natural disasters that we've arranged to greet you. That was a good no. I have a friend who says, actually, we don't have natural disasters except for summer here. But yes, my clicker. OK, so we're going to talk about uh, the moist moon. Uh, of course, the concept that the moon is moist is actually a pretty recent sort of thing. Let's see if I've got this. All right, so now the moon is, certainly has an association with water here on Earth in the form of our tides. I have a little animation going up here uh, just to remind you what our, what our earthly connection is to the moon. As it goes around, it raises a bulge of water around the Earth on the side facing the moon and the side opposite. And then the Earth rotates underneath that, so each part of the Earth goes up and meets that bulge as it rotates around. But the moon itself, we never really think of as terribly watery because, well, it isn't. For, you know, we, we've seen for a long time, you know, we go and visit the moon, it's very dry. Now, when we were looking at sending astronauts to the moon in the 60s, uh, there was a lot of effort that went into trying to predict what the lunar environment was going to be like when they got there. And among other things, people wanted to know if astronauts would get cooked or if they would get frozen, because you have to prepare for either, either circumstance. Uh, and a lot of work was done, for example, using what's, you know, microwave telescopes. We actually have telescopes that operate across a very wide range of the electromagnetic spectrum, including in microwaves. And just as we can use them, use microwaves to heat things up, you can also use that, uh, the natural microwave radiation, to learn whether things are intrinsically warm from how bright they are. And examining the moon, you could see that, well, OK, the, the daylit part near the equator, that's warm, but only sometimes, because the moon rotates very slowly. So it's warm when it's in daylight, and it's cool when it's at night. As you move up to higher latitude, OK, less warm. Oh, colder, colder. And when you get to the poles, it gets pretty darn cold, really cold. In fact, the idea came up that if you're at very high latitude at the moon, very close to the poles, you could have craters that are what do we call permanently shadowed regions, where the crater may be deep enough that the bottom of the crater, in fact, never sees sunlight. In an environment like that, if ice were to form, if you were to just deposit an ice cube in an area that is so cold that, well, it's never seen sunlight and may be at a temperature that's just a, maybe 30 or 40 degrees above absolute zero, that, that chunk of ice could stay there for a billion years or more. So it's possible that you could actually have lasting ice on the moon. Now, we sent people to the moon and landers. And we found that certainly at the low latitude parts that we directly explored, the moon, of course, it's airless. Uh, it's unbelievably dry. Uh, now, when the astronauts were there, they had devices that were able to sense you know, lunar atmosphere to the extent that there is some. And when we say atmosphere in this environment, we mean really tenuous, like, whoa, there's an atom. <laughs> there's another atom, that kind of thing, a really tenuous environment. Uh, but all of these were designed to work uh, in, in the daylight regions, because the astronauts would land essentially towards the morning side, just to make sure that if there were any delays, anything like that, they would come around to the evening side. You know, they would have a long time in daylight, is the point, because they were not equipped to survive a lunar night. They were not equipped to last that long on the moon anyway. So going on a little bit more. Now, in the, in the middle 1990s, uh, there's a spacecraft called Clementine. It's actually, it actually has a uh, model or maybe a flight spare, I didn't check that part, hanging out here uh, above the LEM. They showed the lunar orbiter, uh, lunar, a ranger, and a lunar surveyor uh, spacecraft from the 60s. Clementine is from 19, the mid-1990s. Uh, and among other things, it did some experiments with radar because it was a polar orbiting spacecraft looking into permanently shadowed regions at the lunar poles. And it provided some suggestions that there was something shinier down in the bottom of some of those permanently shadowed regions. Then a few years later, another mission called Lunar Prospector came along. Lunar Prospector had a few more instruments, one of which in particular I'll be talking about in a moment, that gave even better suggestion that there could be water. There could be water ice. Uh, at the high lunar poles. And the question came up, well, where exactly would it come from? How would it get there? 
And that's what the, I've been holding off on the animation part here. Uh, some folks working at Goddard Space Flight Center, where I do a lot of my work, came up with the idea that if you just had a small supply of water molecules at lunar mid-latitude, the lunar equator, it's the surface is warm enough that an individual molecule can go bouncing around, hopping around on the surface, and it will tend to hop away from where it's warm. <laughs> the surface is warm enough that water molecules, any random water molecules that should happen to arrive, will hop away from the warmer region, land where it's colder, and now because it's colder, they, they can hop again, but they can't hop back as far as they hop from the warm part. So it's three steps forward, two steps back, but that's still a step away from where you started. Or it may be three steps forward and then two more steps, that kind of thing. And so you have water molecules can travel away from the warmest part where it's most, you know, most brightly sunlit off towards the terminators of the moon. And if it gets up to the lunar poles, you see up at the top and bottom of the picture, well, if it's cold enough that ice can last there for billions of years, it may just stick to whatever surface is there and just stay, never go away. But what about the water that gets out to those edges? Now, that's, that's a little tougher because the moon does slowly rotate. It rotates fully in one month. And so whatever lands, for instance, on the dawn side rotates around get, to get into sunlight and warms up again. Okay, so well, another experiment came along, another mission, and I happened to be on this one, uh, called Epoxy. We were actually reusing the Deep Impact spacecraft. Uh, and this is a picture that actually I did from the Epoxy mission. This is not a faked up picture of the Earth and the Moon next to each other. This is an actual photograph we took of the Earth and the Moon so you're not really seeing them next to each other. You're seeing the moon in the foreground, but the spacecraft was far enough away that there's no parallax or anything. So this is actually one frame from a 24-hour movie we shot where we saw the, the moon going past the Earth. Uh, you'll notice that the Earth is very blurry. This was a space mission desi designed to get up close to a comet and actually drop a, you know, an object into the comet. So it was originally called Deep Impact. And that name is kind of suggestive for good reasons. It was named before the movie came out, though. Well, we still had the non-impacting part of the spacecraft was left, and we used it for other things, including the epoxy mission. We did a number of things, but one of my colleagues, Jessica Sunshine, and that is the greatest name for a planetary scientist ever, Dr. Sunshine. Uh, but Jessica Sunshine, uh, is actually the, was the deputy scientist for the mission uh, after Micah Hearn at University of Maryland. And she happened to notice a really remarkable thing. Uh, they were doing uh, calibration measurements on the moon during a couple of flybys of the Earth and the moon. And she looked very closely at the spectra that we took. I'm going to guess that this little thing is a laser. Oh, it is. Uh, now, these ones are laboratory spectra of minerals that are here on the Earth. But this dent you see in the spectrum of each one, all these, what they're measuring is the light that you get off of this mineral if you shine, this is actually infrared light, so this is light you and I can't see with our eyes. Uh, but if you shine a lamp on it, you get a reflection coming off, and then there's this dent in the spectrum. And that dent is due to the presence of water, of, it's actually in the form of water of hydration. Uh, if you've ever worked with Plaster of Paris, Plaster of Paris is a dry mineral called gypsum. It's actually calcium sulfate. And when you add water to it, it, it doesn't chemically change it, but the water attaches to those little calcium sulfate molecules in there and hooks them together. And that's what converts it into a solid. So the solid form of gypsum or is what you make. You take dried gypsum, add water, you get plaster of Paris. If you want to recycle it, you put it in your oven, you bake it again, the water evaporates off, and it goes back to being a loose powder. Well, I don't think any of these ones is actually gypsum that, that Jessica was looking at, but these are all reasonably well understood minerals, and this dent is created by the hydrated form if there's a small amount of water. And what they found was if you map the location of the same kind of little dent in the spectrum of minerals on the surface of the moon, you found a whole lot of this little dent near the terminator, near the edge of the day-night region, and it went away when you got to the sunlight part, meaning those water molecules that have been hopping across the moon, they're actually li staying, living is not the right term, but staying out near the terminators 
uh, even on at the low latitude, at the day and the night terminator, at the dawn and dusk. And that was a really strange and unexpected thing. Now, the only place they could see it is where there was sunlight shining on the moon. It doesn't mean that there wasn't the same kind of hydration over here on the night side, but because the, the way that the experiment worked was to look at reflected sunlight, you could only see it where there's daylight. And, that, and you can also only see it as deep into the surface as daylight goes, which is about, okay, it's about a nanometer or so into the surface, very little into the surface. And the question is, well, how much water is there on the moon? And that's where we come along. This is a spacecraft called Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. I've been working on LRO, it's called, since uh, last August, actually. We have a number of instruments on the spacecraft that are uh, really for studying the composition of the lunar surface, looking at the space environment. But one of the things that we're designed to look at is the presence of water on the moon using what's called the Lunar Exploration Neutron Detector. This is a picture of the moon if you could see in neutrons. You know, when normally you're looking at things with light, uh, you've got photons of light and red things are kind of a low energy photon of light and green things are a medium energy photon of light and blue things are a high energy of photon of light. Okay, so where it's blue on here, that's energetic neutrons. Where it's red on here, that's low energy neutrons. And where it's kind of greenish in there, that's kind of the medium energy neutrons. So this is a neutron picture or neutron map of the moon. This is the Mare region where other people claim to see the man on the moon, although personally I just cannot see it myself. And these little craters and things are other Mare regions. Uh, we've even got a giant impact basin down here. Uh, now this reddish up here suggests that there's less of these high energy neutrons than there are in the middle. And you would be right if you guessed that. Uh, because that was what Lunar Prospector showed was evidence for water at high latitudes that where there are more, new, sorry, where there's more water, we get fewer of these high energy neutrons. Then we get to this next picture. What we're looking at here, this is what my, my, uh, my friends in the education and public outreach for, field refer to officially as a squiggly line plot. All these really squiggly things here, that's really the detailed data. And so it's this bold part is an average of those things to make it easier to see what's going on. Well, we've got, in general, we expect to see more neutrons where the surface is perfectly dry and fewer neutrons where there making, can be some water in the surface. What we see is few neutrons here at the dawn area, a lot of neutrons over here in the mid-afternoon, and then actually we've got kind of a dip again here at the dusk. And if we turn that around, I can estimate how much water that corresponds to. And we're actually seeing something that, that makes some sense. We seem to have water right there at the dawn area. We also have some water in the dusk area. And this actually fits some models for how we would expect water to be transported on the moon, away from the center, over to the edges. Now the question is, why is it staying there? And there's also, there was the question of how much. Uh, I'm, I've been estimating that that's actually about the equivalent of the very small amount of water that my friends on epoxy measured uh, going about this deep into the lunar surface, about seven centimeters deep. Now, that, that's not a very accurate number. The critical point is it means that we need to measure things with devices that measure in centimeters, not meters and not millimeters, but centimeters. So do we have our answer then? Am I all done? I mean. Uh, this is stuff I actually presented at the Lunar and Planetary Science Conference in March. Uh, I've made a few changes since then, but not surprisingly in science, the answer is no, we're not done yet. Probably the most dangerous thing in science is to get a result that fits your expectations because it means that you may not be thinking about it hard enough. You look at it and say, well, that's what I expected, so we must be right. If you stop thinking at that point, you are in danger because we, our field is rife with cases where people have seen what they expected to see and they say, okay, I'm done, and they don't dig that one level deeper to discover that they have fooled themselves worse than anybody else in the world. So that's, that's the worst part. I have to make sure I haven't fooled myself on this. Uh, not all of our instruments agree with each other at this point. That would be one of our problems. Lunar Prospector made measurements kind of like this, but they didn't see this. So does that mean that it's not there in the Lunar Prospector data, or does it just mean they weren't 
sharp enough to figure that out. So that's the kind of thing we need to work on. So it's a work in progress. By this time next year, I may have decided I was wrong about everything. And that's science. <laughs>